Let's take a look at the basics of drying plastic resin in preparation for processing. First, a little background on why we need to dry. Proper drying is essential to assure the best possible appearance and performance of the plastic product being produced. Improperly dried resin can allow product degradation and physical defects to occur. Defects like streaks, bubbles, brittleness, and even burning while being processed are likely if the material is not thoroughly dried. In fact, inadequate drying has been found to be the number one cause of all quality problems when processing resins that have the ability to absorb moisture, particularly those being produced with resins that fall into the category of performance plastics or engineering grade resins. Typically, these polymers require thorough drying in order to achieve the characteristics required for their use. They require trouble-free drying systems. In terms of moisture, there are two major classes of polymers, non-hygroscopic and hygroscopic. Let's take a look at non-hygroscopic resins first. Non-hygroscopic resins attract only surface moisture. Moisture is collected on the surface of the pellet but not absorbed into it, nor its molecular structure. Since the moisture goes no further than the surface of the pellet, it can typically be removed with just hot air circulation around the pellet. Here are some examples of non-hygroscopic products you are probably familiar with. Hygroscopic resins, on the other hand, have a strong affinity for moisture and humidity. Like a sponge, hygroscopic resins will absorb moisture past the surface of the pellet, it will go deep inside, into its molecular structure, even when exposed to just the humidity in the air. As a result, resin manufacturers often deliver this material to processors in sealed containers to minimize the resin's exposure to humidity that can be absorbed into the material. Here are some examples of popular hygroscopic resins that we see every day, including optical, household, recreation, and industrial products. And one of the biggest hygroscopic resins out there, PET. This is the main ingredient of a wide range of packaging products for beverage and food products. So what does this affinity to moisture mean to the equipment we provide to remove this moisture? Well, it means that we must produce a means of reaching deep into the pellet and release the moisture from within the molecular structure of the polymer chains and then carry that moisture away from the pellet environment. There are a number of fundamental drying parameters our equipment must provide to produce this action. Let's take a look at them. The first parameter is temperature, or more precisely, heat. The drying equipment must produce the proper level of heat and deliver that heat to each pellet to drive the moisture out of the very heart of the pellet. If the pellet is not heated, it will not release its absorbed moisture. Typical drying temperatures range from 180 to 350 degrees Fahrenheit. The next parameter is dew point. Now this might be a new or strange term to you, but it is simply a description used to define the dryness of air. Technically, it is the temperature at which moisture in the air begins to condense and we use dew point temperature as a definition of how dry the air that surrounds the pellet must be. The dryer's goal is to drive down the dew point of the air surrounding the pellet so that water molecules, driven from the pellet by heat, will be caught in that dry air. Dew point temperatures for drying hygroscopic resins are typically in the zero to minus 40 degree range, with minus 40 considered the optimum level for a drying system. As an interesting side note, minus 40 is the same temperature on both the Celsius and Fahrenheit temperature scales. Thus far, with the drying parameters of temperature and dew point, we can begin to understand the drying process. First, we create very low dew point air. Then we heat that air to reduce its relative humidity and allow it to force water molecules from the polymer chains within the pellet. The thirsty, low dew point air can then take on that released moisture. So far, so good. The next critical drying parameter is time. The drying process does not happen instantaneously. 
It takes time for the heat being sent to the pellets to be absorbed into each pellet and force the water molecules to migrate from inside the pellet to the surface. How long does it take? Well, it varies somewhat for each material, and the material suppliers specify this time, as well as the temperature and dew point required to dry their materials and allow them to achieve the characteristics they were designed to provide. Generally, about four hours of residence time is required for proper drying. The drying hopper is critical for time. Even though the material moves through it to the processing machine, the hopper is large enough to assure that the proper residence time is provided for each and every pellet so that it can be thoroughly dried prior to processing. And the hopper is designed to provide even hot air distribution through all of the pellets inside the hopper while simultaneously assuring that material moves through the hopper evenly without funneling down through the middle or taking any shortcuts that will shorten its exposure time to the drying air. The drying hopper design is quite important to thorough drying. While we are talking about time, let's talk about how fast moisture leaves the material during drying. Look at this example showing the moisture removal that occurs during four hours of drying. You can see that most of the moisture removal actually occurs during the first hour of drying. This rapid rate of removal can be deceiving, and many processors assume that this steep drop equates to complete drying. Some dryer manufacturers even go so far as to claim that this rapid drying is the same as thorough drying with their equipment. But looking closer, we can see that even though there is an initial large drop in moisture level, drying to the resin manufacturer's specification is not accomplished to almost four hours of residence time. Back to our drying parameters. We've talked about temperature, dew point, and time. The final key to good drying is airflow, created by blowers inside the dryer. Drying systems require airflow for two reasons. To deliver heat to the pellets and to take away moisture that has been released from the pellets. The air from the drying system enters the drying hopper with a very low dew point. It's thirsty for moisture. And it's also heated allowing it to force moisture from deep within the pellets. Once the moisture is released from the pellets, the thirsty air will pick up that moisture and carry it back to the dryer to repeat the process. So we can see that these four critical parameters all work in concert to achieve proper drying. Now let's take a look and see how these elements are implemented in different types of dryers and drying systems to meet processor needs. Three types of dryers are prominent for the removal of moisture in plastic pellets. Most popular type of dryer is the desiccant dryer that uses desiccant media to create low dew point air for the drying process. Resin manufacturers recommend desiccant dryers for drying their hygroscopic materials. Second are hot air dryers that are used primarily on non-hygroscopic resins and provide only heat to remove surface moisture from resins. Hot air dryers do not provide low dew point air, just heated air. The third family of dryers is commonly referred to as compressed air dryers, and these dryers use a combination of air compression, which naturally lowers the dew point of air, and often supplement that with a membrane filter to provide low dew point air for drying. Let's take a quick look at each of these and see how they work, starting with desiccant dryers. And to get us started, Let's take a close look at that desiccant and see how it provides low dew point air for drying. Desiccant is a moisture absorbing chemical similar to the silica gel you find in the box with your new camera. Desiccant uses a principle called adsorption to catch and then release moisture. Adsorption is a process defined as to take up a liquid or gas onto the surface of a solid forming a molecular film. In dehumidifying dryers, desiccant's adsorption characteristics allow the desiccant to first collect moisture from the resin and then, when heated, release that moisture, allowing the desiccant to then absorb more. We can see that the moisture adsorption temperature for desiccant is in the 100 plus degrees F range. In this range, the desiccant is thirsty, looking for moisture. But this moisture absorbing characteristic decreases as the temperature increases. And once we get to the 350 to 400 degrees F range, the process is reversed. 
and the desiccant is now desorbing or giving up its collected moisture. We call this part of the drying process regeneration, since we regenerate the desiccant's ability to absorb moisture. But in a drying system that uses heat to force moisture from pellets, we must assure that the temperature of the air that touches the desiccant does not exceed its temperature range for adsorbing moisture, that 100 plus degree zone. Going a bit deeper, we can see that we have two distinct modes of dryer operation. Drying the material in the drying hopper, and then drying or regenerating the desiccant. Let's take a look at how these two processes work in different types and generations of desiccant dryers. Early designs, which are still used today by some manufacturers, place beads of desiccant into two tanks, called towers, so that one tower could be used to dry material while the other is regenerated. As you can see, these systems could be quite large, required a large amount of desiccant, and employed air valves to switch the drying air and regeneration air flows from tower to tower, as controlled by a timer. The desiccant beads used in these systems include a clay binder that provide the structure for holding the desiccant chemical. Later, Conair placed more densely packed desiccant beads into smaller tanks for improved drying performance and then rotated the tanks through the airflow paths instead of switching the airflow. This greatly reduced size and refined the dryer operation. Finally, Conair adopted the wheel or rotor design shown here which did away with desiccant beads altogether. Now note that all three designs, in spite of their size differences, provide equivalent drying capability. The desiccant wheel design consists not of desiccant beads, but desiccant film, crystallized onto lightweight glass fibers, forming a structure not unlike a thick piece of corrugated cardboard that air can pass through. Unlike beads with their clay binder, nearly the entire wheel has moisture absorbing qualities and passes air more easily and with better moisture adsorption. Quite an improvement. Desiccant dryers are provided in a wide range of models and capabilities. Conair's extensive range of standalone dryers can dry from 13 to 6,250 pounds per hour when coupled with a drying hopper that is mounted directly on the processing machine or on a stand. Hopper sizes range from one half cubic foot through 900 cubic foot or from 18 to 31,500 pounds of capacity. Every dryer hopper combination is designed to provide exactly the right levels of dew point, temperature, time and airflow for the drying task it promises to provide. Smaller dryers, up to 335 pounds per hour, can be mounted together with a drying hopper and even a material loading system onto a wheeled cart to provide a complete portable drying system that can be easily rolled up next to a processing machine to provide self-contained drying and delivery of dried material to that machine. Processors that change materials frequently love these mobile units since they can be easily rolled in and out when it's time to make a material change. Desiccant dryers can also be provided in a central style, where one dryer provides dry air to a row of hoppers. Each hopper is equipped with its own heater so that different temperatures can be set for each material in each hopper. Many times, these multi-hopper systems are coupled to a dry air conveying system to then take the dried material to processing machines located elsewhere via tubing. These resin work systems are very popular for processors with limited space in their plants and or for making rapid material changes. One hopper can be pre-drying the next material to be molded while another hopper finishes up the current molding job. Quite efficient. Next on our list of dryer types is hot air dryers. These dryers employ no desiccant and actually provide only hot air to dry material using the same principle we use in our clothes dryers at home. Simple. Hot air dryers are suitable for non-hygroscopic materials that only attract surface moisture, so the task of drying these materials is easily accomplished by simply blowing hot air across the pellets in a drying hopper. 
Sometimes hot air dryers are also used to keep materials dry after they have been dehumidified by a desiccant dryer. Some processors have luck using them on non-critical hygroscopic materials, but this can be risky. Conair provides hot air dryers in a modular fashion, consisting of separate heater, control, and blower components, which are connected to a drying hopper sized to their throughput needs. And hot air dryers operate open-looped, meaning that the heated air is not recirculated, but simply exhausted out the top of the drying hopper along with moisture that has been blown off of the material. Last on our list of dryer types are compressed air dryers. Now these are not to be confused with factory hardware that dries the air supply coming from an air compressor. What we refer to as a compressed air dryer is a dehumidifying dryer that uses compressed air as an air source in place of the blowers used in hot air and desiccant dryers. And compressed air dryers use the natural moisture reducing characteristics of compressing air to lower the dew point of the drying air. Now this is interesting because the dryer itself just became very, very simple. It now consists of only a heater and a temperature controller, since the air generating and dehumidifying equipment are part of the factory's compressed air services located in the back room. Let's take a closer look using this diagram. First, we presume the compressed air quality in the plant is suitable and not overly loaded with moisture. Most modern air supplies include moisture traps and conditioners for delivery of fairly dry compressed air for robots and other precision gear that must get dry air. We can assume that compressed air will enter the dryer at about plus 40 degrees F dew point. Fairly dry, but not yet dry enough for drying resin. The decompression of the air will drop the dew point about 40 degrees, down to zero degrees F. From there, the air is heated and flow regulated into a small integrated drying hopper where the proper residence time will allow the material to be dried at the proper temperature at zero degrees F dew point. Air is exhausted out the top of the drying hopper along with collected moisture from the material. Pretty simple operation, especially since no moving parts are used on the compact dryer. Uh-oh, what about minus 40 degrees dew point? Isn't that the industry standard for drying resin? Can we get there from here? The answer is yes. For more precise drying, a popular option for compressed air dryers is added, a membrane and filter assembly. Here's what the system will look like with these items installed. Air delivery is still at plus 40, but by running the air through a membrane and filter assembly made for compressed air, the moisture level drops from plus 40 to zero degrees dew point before the air even enters the dryer. From there, decompression of the air takes the dew point from zero degrees down to minus 40 degrees. We are now ready to dry even the most finicky material. Conair provides compressed air dryers in sizes from 0.4 to 50 pounds per hour in compact dryers equipped with hoppers ranging from 0.125 to 2.5 cubic feet. These slimline model dryers provide a great drying solution for processors with low material throughputs and small machines. Are they better than desiccant dryers? Well, they are simpler and smaller, but we must remember that they are using a factory utility, compressed air, that is produced elsewhere in the plant and must be relied upon to provide the airflow for drying. The compressed air supply must be dry, and strong enough to provide a constant supply of air that never falters, even when other devices in the plant are also consuming compressed air. So there's the basics of resin drying for you, including a wide range of desiccant dryers, hot air dryers, and compressed air dryers, all using their own form of the essential drying parameters, temperature, dew point, time, and airflow. We hope this was informative for you, and we appreciate your time and attention. Thanks.